It's great to have you joining us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. I'm host Carrie Freeman coming to you in March of 2023 from Atlanta in the Muscogee Creek Territory, part of the Piedmont region in the foothills of the Appalachia Mountain Range. Today, we're going to be talking about an unprecedented farm bill proposal to be considered in the U.S. Congress, the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act, put forward by Senator Cory Booker, a member of the Senate Agriculture Committee. There are a lot of important improvements proposed in this groundbreaking legislation, so we're devoting a double-long show to this topic, especially since the myriad problems with industrial animal agribusiness rarely get addressed in Congress, despite how much the public disapproves of factory farming and how much taxpayer money goes to subsidize it. My guest is Leah Garces, longtime farmed animal advocate and president of the nonprofit group Mercy for Animals here to help us understand all the various exciting aspects of the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act and what it proposes to do to help humans, like agricultural workers and also taxpayers, as well as helping other animal species in terms of welfare. By by the end of the show, you may be interested in contacting your congressional representatives to share your opinion on the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act. Let me tell you about my guest and her organization. Mercy for Animals is a nonprofit whose mission is to end industrial animal agriculture by constructing a just and sustainable food system. They imagine a world in which we nourish ourselves with food that is kind to animals and sustainable for the planet and all who share it. A world in which eating is an act of compassion in which no one is exploited or forced to exploit another. Based in the U.S., they work worldwide engaging with the public and with corporations and small farmers, conducting investigations and encouraging farm policies. The group's website is mercyforanimals.org. That's O-R-G. My guest is Leah Garces, the president of Mercy for Animals. Leah has over 20 years of leadership experience in the animal protection movement, particularly in the agriculture sector. She's partnered with some of the world's largest food companies on her mission to end factory farming. Previously, she oversaw international campaigns at the World Society for the Protection of Animals, and she launched the organization Compassion in World Farming here in the United States. Leah is also the author of the book Grilled, Turning Adversaries into Allies to Change the Chicken Industry. Leah is the first female and Latinx president of Mercy for Animals. Half Colombian and half American, she's lived in Spain, the UK, and the US. She now lives with her husband, three kids, and companion animals in Atlanta, Georgia. Leah is particularly passionate about mindful leadership, rural economic development, and social justice. Welcome, Leah. Oh, wow. That was quite an intro. Thank you, Carrie. I'm so <laughs> excited to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. This is it's a I wanted an expert to talk about this topic and I thought, well, it'd be great to get Cory Booker on the, the show, but I don't that my emails really weren't going <laughs> getting answered there. I think that they're a little too busy in Congress. So I'm like, oh yes, it's Leah will know how to time talk in Congress. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you would know how to talk about this. But okay, so before we get into all the policy stuff, Leah, can you give us a feel for how your experiences visiting animal farms over the years? especially with Compassion and World Farming, led you to want to dedicate your career to ending factory farming? Yeah. uh, You know, prior to solely focusing on farmed animals, I used to work on all animals. And in my, before I was 30, I had been to 30 different countries traveling Mm. all over the world, working on programs and campaigns to reduce the suffering of animals. Everything from bear bile farming in China to dolphin trade that for dolphinariums to uh, working horses in Colombia or stray dogs in India. And after seeing all the different ways that humans unfortunately cause suffering to animals, there was one that spoke to me the most, which was farmed animals. It was the one that I felt the most number of animals are impacted, but also I felt the most hopeful that there was this way that each of us three times a day could make a difference through what we eat. And I turned my focus over 10 years ago to solely focus on farmed animals. I visited many, many farms and it never stops breaking my heart when I step into the factory farms that I visit, seeing tens of thousands of chickens stuffed wall to wall, wanting to rescue them, wanting to save them. Mm -hmm. But there are 9 billion of them raised and slaughtered in this country alone. So that's so hard. 
And so instead, I focus on institutional change at the corporate and the government level, trying to really impact as many animals as possible and reduce their suffering. I know you've worked on farmed animal issues for decades, including at the policy level. Help set the stage for our listeners to understand how little federal legislation addresses farmed animals and factory farming, putting this current Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act into perspective of where it fits in the legislative landscape. Well, a really good example of that is when we look at chickens. So 99, or sorry, 90% of all farmed animals in this country are chickens raised for meat. And yet there is little to no legislation protecting those animals on farm. They are explicitly excluded as well from the Slaughter Act, the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. And so we have this complete absence of protection and regulation when it comes to the animal that is farmed the most, that ends up on our plates the most. And that's just one example. The lack of regulation around the environment is also a huge problem. For example, in North Carolina, where they are literally outputting the most amount of meat coming from chickens than any other state, you literally don't have to have a permit for the environment to set up a poultry farm. They do not even know how many farms they have. So there's a serious lack of oversight and accountability, which is why this act is so important. Right. And I, from what I understand, the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act that Senator Cory Booker proposed at the end of 2022 is a so-called marker bill that's meant to amend the 2023 Farm Bill. Can you help us understand how this is pretty critical in terms of timing because Congress only amends the Farm Bill every five years, right? That's right. Yeah. And just for those of you who may not know, the Farm Bill is really a very critical opportunity to influence federal policy. Uh, The Farm Bill is revised only five years, and it's basically uh, the Congress's legislation that they try to pass that sets the stage for national agriculture, nutrition, conservation, and forestry policy. And so it's done every five years, uh, and there's a range of programs. And it really generally is considered, it goes through reauthorization, which means that unless amendments are put forward and passed, then the previous bill is just passed as it was. Hmm. And so a marker bill, it what we have put forward in with Cory Booker, is legislation to change and amend the current farm bill. And the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act is one such marker bill. And at Mercy for Animals and its coalition members are working within Congress to get uh, some of the provisions of the Industrial Animal Agriculture Accountability Act into the final farm bill. Oh, like, could it be voted on separately from the farm bill or is it? No. Okay, so it has to be voted on with the farm bill. So within the farm bill. Okay. Yeah, so Um, marker marker bills are really, really important. Uh, It's a bill introduced into Congress. It signals policy ideas and it's a way to gather support from, for example, grassroots groups, other lawmakers or advocates for a particular policy act. Uh, and so there's a number of marker bills that will go forward in, in as part of the, and the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act as is one really important potential way to reduce farmed animal suffering and increase accountability for corporations. Definitely. So that really means that the timing is important on this because we don't want to wait another five years or another decade, because <laughs> that's, that's billions right. of taxpayer dollars, thousands of farm workers and billions of farmed animals continuing to be negatively impacted by our corporate dominated, rather broken food system. So that's also why I wanted to do a show on this, because I, I think it's so important. Um, Leah, can you give us just an overview, like by listing for us various types of issues the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act aims to address, and then we can get more into each of these issues in detail over the course of the show? Yeah, at high level, there's about eight sections um, that are most important to Mercy for Animals and the work we're putting forward within the IAA, the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act. Um, Those include restrictions on certain methods of depopulation, which is killing animals on farm during emergencies. Um, Two is minimal minimal labor standards for livestock and poultry workers. Three is prohibiting the use of incarcerated workers. Uh, Another one is transportation 
limitations, hours limitations for, for farmed animals on their way to slaughter. Um, another one is unlawful slaughter practices involving what's called downed animals or non-ambulatory animals. The sixth is an inclusion of all poultry in the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. The seventh is ending really high, fast line speeds mm -hmm. um, and really getting rid of this self-inspection system that currently exists. And finally, there's kind of a part which is providing millions of dollars in funding for transitioning to better practices. And there's a number of things under that. But that's the top level eight sections. Yeah. And then, I mean, I'm just so impressed by the array of different things and the array of protections yeah. um, that are addressed here, like so many things that uh, need to get done. So um, that's why I wanted to dedicate it, um, a longer show to it today so we could get through a lot of these things that that you just mentioned. Um, and But before we start, I wanted to say, I think you know something about the backstory of how these initiatives came to be part of the Industrial Agricultural Accountability Act in terms of Senator Booker seeking input from community groups associated with farming. Um, like I know Mercy for Animals, what role did you play um, in helping to craft these provisions? Yeah, we have a really wonderful team. And Mercy for Animals is really proud to have partnered with Senator Booker and the ASPCA on the introduction of the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act. And we, I think the interesting thing about this particular marker bill is, as you say, the diversity of issues covered under here. It's a yeah. really important way of showing all the different ways that factory farming detrimentally impacts our world from the workers to the animals to the tax dollar being wasted. And so in that there's input sought from all these different groups that normally sort of work in silos. But I think in this case, we're finding that we're finally coming together all realizing this is a system that oppresses so many different groups. And if we combine our power, we're going to have a lot more success. Absolutely. Let's start with the disaster mitigation aspects of the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act. In, in light of extreme weather disasters exacerbated by the climate crisis, as well as disease outbreaks like COVID-19 and bird flu, disaster mitigation seems quite timely. Leah, can you tell us what this bill proposes as improved ways of dealing with inevitable disasters impacting confined animal feeding operations? Yeah, I mean, as you've just pointed out, we're at unprecedented levels of disasters. Mm. And the way that our current system deals with them is mostly the taxpayer cleans up that cost, not the corporation. And at the same time, these corporations are having record profits and it doesn't make sense. No. So we're talking about in the bill establishing some accountability to those companies. So some of those things include establishing uh, the an office of high risk um, animal feeding operation, disaster mitigation enforcement. So be a new office that's responsible. And that office would be the kind of gatekeeper, if you will. And they would require industrial operators to register. They would have to create plans. They would be accountable to those plans. None of this exists right now, by the way. Yeah. And these um, are plans on how they're going to deal with inevitable floods and um, anything pandemics. From, yeah. Anything, yeah. Anything yeah. from, um, I mean, during COVID, COVID is, is what really has brought this up yeah. the priority list because what happened during COVID is while the rest of us were in isolation, slaughterhouse workers were still going to work. And in fact, the president compelled them to go to work mm -hmm. and they were standing shoulder to shoulder and thousands of them got sick, hundreds of them died. Mm -hmm. And there was a there was a shortage of workers showing up to slaughterhouses, meaning there were no people to slaughter the animals, meaning the animals were not being sent to slaughter, they were on the farms and they had no place to go and they had no more food. And so this, the, and they had a lot of uh, health problems because they're not meant to live that long. And so they were slaughtered on farm. And the coverage for that came from the government in, and really the companies should have paid for that because in this right. same period, these companies experienced record profits. During COVID, the government 
sent poultry and livestock producers $270 million for pandemic assistance. And they also, they paid millions of dollars for depopulation, which is the killing of animals on farm. Um, and it went on, sorry, not $4 million, $40 million uh, for depopulation. And this way of killing the animals is horrific. It includes what's called ventilation shutdown, which is exactly what you imagine it to be. They literally just cut off the ventilators and the animals cooked to death inside of those yeah. warehouses. So these are the kinds of things that were in the act would make industrial operators responsible for the costs associated with depopulation, with compensation to the contract farmers for workers' compensation. And right now they're not. So it would also restrict the use of this ventilation shutdown and other cruel methods of, of mass on-farm killing. Um, what what kind of killing do you think they would do since the farms themselves are not really equipped? They're not slaughterhouses. Yeah. And of course, you it, depending on the type of farm, you could be talking about hundreds to tens of thousands, you know, of, of animals. Um, is there some, uh, and they do the depopulation because it's the easiest thing to do. So they're basically just suffocating them to death. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's awful. But like, what else would they do? If, it's if, a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a I don't question. know. Like, it's if there's no real good solution here because well, they're raising yeah. way too many animals and they can't humanely deal with them. Well, in the case of chickens, we're talking about chickens are put onto a farm every six weeks. Yeah. They only live for six weeks at max, usually. Uh, and that's the average. So it would actually be planning on the corporation's part to not even hatch those animals in the first place. So you'd go back. If they had to actually pay for that, they would go back and not even hatch the animals, not even breed the animals. They're breeding and hatching so quickly. It's this massive system that's happening at rapid pace. It's not a matter of changing how, you know, we don't want this inhumane slaughter, but if they're not allowed to do it, they're going to find other solutions, which would be, for example, not putting the animals on the farm in the first place if they can't guarantee that they're going to go to slaughter because there's some problem with the supply. And that's what we're, by putting the onus on the companies and having them pay for it, they're going to look for solutions that don't put them in that emergency situation in the first place. But right now, they don't care because somebody will pick up the bill. And what we need to do is hold them accountable and have them pick up the bill. That will very quickly change their behavior and their planning practices. I was going to, I wanted to say that I think that most of us don't even know that we are paying for this because I didn't really see much news stories about, I mean, I guess the stories during COVID were more about, you know, just uh, there were so many <laughs> things to talk about, but we didn't, I didn't realize that when all these animals were getting killed on the farm, that we were essentially buying the, their bodies since the 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 industry couldn't make money on selling them anymore, you know, for meat. And I, I think that's just crazy that that wasn't something that we all knew about, those millions of dollars of, of subsidies to this industry. So it wasn't until this Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act that I even really understood that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what's really important about this is is saying farming at this scale is fragile. So if you want to do it this way, you have to pay for it. You have to plan. And yeah. the taxpayer needs to stop picking up the bill for that. The government needs to stop picking up the bill because there are better practices. They're just not doing them because somebody else is cleaning up their mess. Somebody else is paying for it. Right. And Leah, the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act also deals with improvements to labor laws for workers at slaughterhouses, as well as contract growers of animals, particularly related to dealing with disasters like bird flu or COVID outbreaks or extreme weather events. Can you tell us about these labor improvements? Yeah, um, there's, there's two aspects to the bill that I want to highlight. One is setting minimum standards for uh, farm animal and, and poultry workers. And the other is prohibiting the use of incarcerated workers. So first the incarcerated workers, it would just, it would prohibit the use of prison labor during disaster yes. mitigation events. And I mean, the figures are in the tens of thousands. People don't realize this, but tens of thousands of incarcerated workers work in farming and food related jobs. And so it would prohibit them from, especially in disaster mitigation events from uh, using prison labor. Because they don't really, really have 
much many rights you know obviously prison workers and then they're put in this dangerous um really ugly situation too emotionally violent and just they may you know that, that they didn't yeah, I, I I was very happy to see this, even though I actually didn't know that prison workers were doing this. Again, another thing I didn't know. Yeah. And that's part of the bill's purpose, right, is to highlight all yeah. these aspects that people don't know about and expose them for what they are as these yeah. kind of detrimental impacts uh, to our society. Um, so the second part is labor standards, and it would require uh, the payment of severance to workers and the payment of lost revenue to contract farmers uh, when industrial operators terminate their employment or contract because of a disaster. Um, so right now you could do that and the farmer would not get any severance when, and would still have this tremendous debt because they will have taken out hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of loans in order to pay for the equipment, for the warehouse, et cetera. That's all in the farmer's back, that debt. Um, it also requires health care coverage for workers and contract workers during disaster mitigation events and for the following two years afterwards. Oh, that's great, too, because also their health may be put at risk because especially in pandemics. That's what we saw during COVID. And yeah. it's an it's been an important highlight. Yeah. Um, and so many also of the farm workers um, are particularly vulnerable um, to being exploited uh, by their employers. Um, and so I could see, and they could just get terminated so easily with, and then because or they don't come in because they're sick and then they just get fired right. or they're worried. They don't want to come in because they're worried about, you know, catching a disease and then they just get fired. So right. I think the severance pay and the healthcare it helps overcome some of the, um, the vulnerability they have kind of economically. Well- Exactly. It, it, again, would create a little sting for the company and prevent them from doing so without thinking about it. Right. But right now, it's just, a, it's just a totally throwaway idea. They can do it. There's no punishment. There's no impact. And the only one who bears the cost is the worker. And that's how most of factory farming functions. It is not the bargain. Cheap meat, dairy, and eggs is not the bargain we think it is. In fact, someone, they, all of those costs are externalized to the worker, to the farm animals, to their environment. And somebody is paying the price. We just don't see it on the price tag or on the menu. And this also helps make some of the plant-based alternatives or other types of produce and stuff that don't get as many subsidies it makes it kind of evens the playing field a little bit too. So that, that the kind of food right. we need to be eating that's healthier and better for the planet and doesn't harm animals to the same extent um, is uh, anyway, I'd rather us if we have to subsidize anything, be subsidizing that kind of food. Right. But I, it, it is this artificial depression of the cost of um, animal products that is also part of the problem. But we can see, as you mentioned, the externalization onto taxpayers um, yep. and onto the contract growers and onto the employees and different things. Yes, really only there's about a, th- so a third of all of our subsidies go to support the farmed animal industry in wow. some way, shape or form. Only 4% go to fruit and vegetables. That's awful. And all the things and- that we keep, everyone says we need to be eating. Right. Only and only ten yeah. percent of the nation receives the recommended daily amount of fruit and vegetables. So right. our policy is horribly skewed in the wrong direction, away yeah. from good health, away from the good environment, away from a good life. Yeah. If you're just joining us on Radio Free Georgia, this is In Tune to Nature. I'm host Carrie Freeman talking about the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act that seeks to amend the latest farm bill being considered in the U.S. Congress in 2023. And here to help us understand its importance is Leah Garces, president of the nonprofit farmed animal advocacy group, Mercy for Animals. Their website is mercyforanimals.org. They also have a special page on this issue that is mercyforanimals.org forward slash IAA. And those are the initials of the act. Um, And so IAA is added to the end of the website, mercyforanimals.org forward slash IAA. Um, I also wanted to, uh, since we're talking about labor issues, I thought I would just also ask right now about the slaughter line speeds 
And because that was also a provision in this bill. So, and that doesn't necessarily relate to the disaster mitigation, but to me, it is a labor issue and an animal welfare issue. Can you yes. speak to that? Yes. Um, so currently the line speeds are so fast for both pigs and for chickens. Currently chickens and turkeys can be slaughtered at 175 birds per minute, which is unimaginably Oh my fast. gosh. And that is, if you can just imagine what it's like to work on a line like that. And if you think like when I snap my finger, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that's how many birds are being slaughtered at a time. Mm -hmm. And a worker will have to cut that bird, will have a particular task that they have to complete in that second. And they have to do that relentlessly for hours without mm -hmm. any breaks. People literally wear diapers because they don't get bathroom breaks. And again, as we just spoke of, this is a very vulnerable population, often immigrants who here on special visas and they fear if they speak yes. up, they don't, they will lose that right and they will have to go back to their country or they will lose their income. It's a very vulnerable politically, socially, and so they can't speak up. And so right. this is a very important aspect of the bill, which we've been working on in different ways to slow down the line speeds. This would... Currently, there are waivers permitted, and many of the companies are taking advantage of these waivers. So it would terminate waivers and programs or regulations that allow for line speed increases and reduce the number of federal inspectors and meatpacking plants. And it would terminate the... So basically, this, this waiver allows for all these kinds of terrible things. It allows them to reduce the number of inspectors. It allows them to speed up the lines. And it allows them to self-inspect, like grading their own papers. Yeah, so that no would, thanks. Yeah, we would end that. And so it would slow down the line speeds. It would put in inspectors again, and it would not allow them to self-inspect. Yeah, these are all really critical uh, to the to the workers and to the the animals as well. And since we're talking about slaughtering, Leah, one of the provisions in the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act that really stood out to me as long overdue is to get birds included within the Humane Slaughter Act, which would be monumental given that the vast majority of animals we slaughter in the U.S. are birds, namely billions of chickens. Can you speak to what it would mean to include chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese within the Humane Slaughter Act protections? Yes, as you mentioned, 90% of all of our farmed animals in this country, the United States, are chickens raised for meat. So not eggs, just meat. That's 9 billion animals are raised and slaughtered every single year. It's a massive number. Oh. And they are excluded, specifically excluded from the Humane Methods of How Slaughter convenient. Act. Yeah. And this was passed in 1978. And it really hasn't been substantially updated since. And we want chickens and turkeys to be included. And the bill, or so the act currently talks about rendering animals insensible to pain before being shackled, hoisted, cast, or cut. And so what we want is for these animals, chickens and turkeys, to be rendered insensible, meaning they're unconscious before a knife is put to their throat. And I know that's graphic, but it's important that they are not suffering more than they have to in these circumstances. And there's a way to do that. We do that for mammals and we're not doing it for poultry. Is it, um, I, I read something about the controlled atmosphere stunning method. Yes. Is that about, it's, it's a kind of like gassing or something like that. So they would be like, it's like being under anesthesia before you get hoisted up by your back legs and then a knife slits your throat and then you go into a boiling tank to have your feathers burned exactly. off. So cur currently one of the most traumatic things for the chickens is that after transport, they're grabbed by their legs upside down and then they're shackled upside down and move totally conscious ar around a fast moving line. They flap their wings. They're mm. sometimes panicking to the extent that sometimes their wings break and sometimes they don't make because of the fast moving lines, they don't make the shackles properly and there's one leg in or the leg yeah. isn't right. And so our... Our, our, what we're urging to happen is to render the animals insensible before they are shackled, which means, and one of the, the methods that's best available right now is controlled atmosphere stunning, which as you say, they go into a, a chamber which has gas, 
which then renders them totally insensible. And then when they're shackled, they're totally unconscious and they never regain consciousness. And then they're sliced and put in the, the boiling tank to remove feathers. And hopefully they're totally unconscious at that stage. Right. Is this, is this something I've seen this on, um, you know, a lot of videos that I've watched, but I didn't know if in your career that you've actually been able to witness the slaughter line, like in person or not. I have, I have, it is, I'm vegan, but I could never take part in a system like that. And I don't, I actually think that if most people had the opportunity to witness slaughter in its industrial way that it is done in such a callous way, I think most people would step away from eating chickens. And I think that controlled atmosphere stunning offers an alternative in which animals are not flapping and suffering and visually distressed, but slaughter is a brutal process, especially at the industrial method. They're widgets in a machine. They're not the, they're not treated like the sentient beings that are just like our dogs and our cats in our home, but they're treated like widgets in a machine in the system. Yeah. And I know it's hard, uh, you know, since both of us are, are vegan, you know, for ethical reasons, it is hard to talk about some of these welfare provisions. Cause of course we would prefer that there wasn't thousands or billions of animals getting lined up, you know, yes. to be killed and that so that we have to find more kind of less grotesque ways to handle it. But yes. to, the, to the extent that it's continuing to happen all the time and has for decades until we make larger changes collectively towards a plant-based diet that is really is also called for for environmental reasons, um, we need to do a better job with you know, the system that we have in place. So that's, and when it comes to laws, that's, you know, typically how they work. Um, they're not as idealistic as, as maybe I am, <laughs> but. Yeah. I think we have a moral obligation to reduce suffering wherever we see the opportunity as yeah. we move towards a world that is fully compassionate in our eating choices. Yeah. Another provision falling within the domain of the humane handling of farmed animals Um within that act, it deals with what they call non-ambulatory livestock, basically mammals like pigs or cows who are downed and can no longer walk and sometimes get dragged to slaughter, which is especially horrific. Leah, can you explain what improvements the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act proposes for animals who can no longer walk? Yes, I'm most hopeful about this particular aspect being passed. It feels like a no-brainer. It's basically closing a loophole in current regulation so that the slaughter of downed pigs is prevented. Uh, Currently you can do that and those animals can end up in our food supply. So let's say a pig has become very sick at the last minute, can't even walk, is dragging, is lame, cannot move for whatever reason, they can drag that animal to slaughter and that, that animal ends up not only suffering incredible, unimaginable amounts, but that meat also ends up on our plates, which seems like a real health problem, a real safety issue. So there's a a win-win here, if that could be applied in that we close the loophole, no slaughter of downed animals, of downed pigs is prevented and the animal will suffer less as a result. Now, is the reason cows are not mentioned, is it because they are, I mean, normally when we talked about downed animals, I remember from years ago, particularly with concerns over mad cow disease and stuff, um, we were talking about cows. Is it because we talked primarily about cows before and we left pigs out? Is that the situation? You know, I don't know why cows have been excluded specifically from this, but I do know that there was a lot of attention given to cows in previous undercover investigations. I believe one of the biggest lawsuits ever was regarding the use of downed cows in school lunches. And Mm -hmm. I think that was the HSUS that spearheaded that particular. So there, there may have been provisions. And so pigs are particularly exposed and and underserved. And that's why the focus is on that. I don't know. Have you ever witnessed this Leah? Because I've I've just seen like pictures of this or videos of this where like a cow or or I usually have seen it with cows uh, where they end up in like a bulldozer type thing yeah. being scooped up and because they're particularly heavy. Yeah. I mean, and it's just it, it's just grotesque. Somebody yeah. who's already suffering is now getting suffering even more to get 
pulled or dragged by a chain or something into the slaughterhouse. Yes, it's it's a particularly horrific practice. And I think anybody who views it thinks of how on how what what a lack of compassion we have towards these animals when this is happening. We yeah. Mercy for Animals is probably most known for our undercover investigations. And part of my job is to review a lot of those videos. Ah. And you know, so that does come across my eyes and it yeah. is horrible to watch it, it's horrible to think that this animal has already suffered so much on the farm yes and then really can't even walk is sick is injured is literally being dragged because they're seen all all that is being seen of them is the the dollar sign on their bodies right and not the sentient beings that they are and and to go along with this let's start talking about the way they're transported from that horrible farm experience to the horrible uh, slaughterhouse experience. Uh, the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act also deals with improvements to welfare issues related to the transport of farmed animals. One of our oldest pieces of farmed animal federal legislation regulated the transport of farmed animals to slaughterhouses on trains and in trucks, but I don't believe it's been amended for many decades. Leah, can you tell us what uh, we may improve about these often grueling transport practices? The basic legislation that we're proposing, which has already been looked at in the European Union, is to shorten the amount of time that farmed animals can be transported. Okay. We want to shorten that to eight hours. So there's a lot of scientific evidence that that's the maximum that animals should be enduring in, ter in terms of their welfare. And some, some animals don't even do well at all. Like pigs in particular become nauseous and have a lot of motion sickness issues um, when they're being transported. So they suffer either way. But the issue with shortening it is it ensures they're not going too long without food and water, the heat, the cold, the extreme temperatures that they might suffer would be reduced. Um, so the the idea is to shorten the amount of time to eight hours over a 10 year period. Currently, transport times are set at 28 hours with exceptions, which many, many take advantage of to 36 hours. And so it Yikes. creates yeah humane standard for current transports of more than eight hours. If you do go over eight hours, there has to be a climate controlled transport from extreme heat and cold access to water, appropriate spacing. None of that exists right now. Because I know I've seen like through the save movement um, that, you know, the animal protection groups will we'll go and give water to pigs who are like waiting in a truck, right, you know, to go into a slaughterhouse or something because they're so thirsty because they're not given um, food or water. They're just crammed in together in whatever heat or cold um, there is. And so the the save movement tries to also bear witness to their existence, because sometimes that's the only time we can see the animals, because we often can't see them when they're in the warehouses on the so-called farms, and then you can't see them in the slaughterhouse, so you see them on the truck. Um, it's just a miserable experience. That's right. And most of the time, what happens is right before about 12 to 24 hours before an animal is sent to transport, the food is removed and most of the water is removed. And the reason is they want their guts empty so that when they go on the slaughter line, that gut, that intestine is empty. And so that feces is not spreading on the workers, on the meat, right. because that's where Campylobacter, E. coli, Salmonella mm -hmm. uh, is trans is, is, is being transitioned from, or is, is being infected, is infecting meat. So they're it's already hungry cool. and thirsty before they even get on the truck and then they could be on there for 36 hours or something. That's right. But that's why yeah. they don't want to feed them or water that right. them water during the transport either because they want their guts empty. But it's horrifically cruel. They're very thirsty. These are animals who have never set foot outside. Mm -hmm. And now they're on a truck that's moving with a different climate. It's very scary for them. And I don't know if any of our listeners in Georgia have ever seen a truck carrying hundreds of cages of chickens openly exposed in the wind on our highways. Like I've seen them out if you're near Gainesville or if you're near Athens, Georgia, and the birds look awful and the feathers are flying and it's a totally depressing sight. But I'm kind of glad when people witness it because so often farmed animals are purposely kept hidden out of sight and out of mind. And then we so we only sometimes see them 
on the way to their deaths. And also you live in, in Georgia. I, I, you've probably seen some of these trucks also when you're driving as well, right, Leah? For, sh- for sure. I think you really can't drive in any direction in Georgia uh. without meeting a truck. Um, and my kids have seen that. And, you know, you can spot them ahead because as you say, the feathers are falling. And at first you think it looks like maybe snow or confetti, but it's feathers that are whipping off the back of a truck. And as you get closer, you see these chickens that are jammed into cages looking very pathetic. And I always think when I see them, at least their suffering is about to end. Yeah. feel so sad that this is the way that our food is being produced, that this is a normalized atrocity in our society. And you're right. This is the only place that people can freely see what and what is happening and how our meat is being produced. But of course, there's this huge, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's right. the tip of the iceberg in terms of the suffering and the harm. Well, we we don't have time to cover some of the other provisions in the bill, but I think they mainly deal with funding for improved government inspections and for better reporting and public transparency, which are also quite important because we desperately need more oversight of factory farming practices. Before uh, we we move on, do you want to just say anything about about those kinds of provisions? Well, I, I think that it's largely underfunded, the accountability aspect. There's a a large funding of the cleanup, but not accountability. And so this would provide funding for uh, everything from improved practices, which I, you know, went into a little bit. So yeah. grants to better facilities, pilot programs to in, in expand inspection, uh, grants for higher welfare transport, and funding for farmers to transition uh, yeah. to plant-based farming. So there's a lot of there's a lot of funding aspects and there's a lot of ways that we want money to be distributed from the taxpayer out into our food system in a more compassionate and sustainable way. Yeah, and I know that uh, you have a transformation project at Mercy for Animals. And um, so people, if they wanted to, could check that out at mercyforanimals.org under the transformation, which helps uh, some farmers who currently grow animals for food if they no longer want to do this and it's not profitable and not um, it's, it's probably causing them mental health problems as well. Uh, and they want to transition to um, a healthier, kind of happier type of farming that's more eco-friendly as well. Um, I know the Transformation Project uh, helps them do that, which is awesome. Yeah, it's my favorite project. It's after so much doom and gloom. I definitely want listeners to go away with, you know, there is a way forward. This Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act is a way of holding them accountable. And then we need to get the system transitioning because so often we talk about like what's wrong and then we talk about where it needs to be. Well, the transition also needs to happen. And our project transformation project is about helping farmers transition out of factory farming because so many don't want to do it because they're trapped in debt and it's not a fun job. It's not a good job. And they want to do something else like microgreens, mushrooms, tomatoes, cucumbers. And we're working with farmers in all sorts of really exciting, viable ways to retrofit their warehouses where they were once growing chickens or pigs into really fantastic um, plant-based options. That, yeah, that is, I, I like it because it's also very humane and then humanitarian because also yes. I don't want our movement to just be labeled like anti-farmer. <laughs> that's not, that's not what we're trying to do. We're pro-food, but we're just yeah. want it to be humane and we're pro-farming, but yeah, we, we want it to be sustainable and, um, and healthy. So yeah, so that's a great project. Leah, as a wrap up for listeners who are interested in talking to their senators and representatives in the house at the, at the federal level related to sharing their opinions on the industrial agriculture accountability act, how and when would you suggest that they go about doing that? Well, I suggest you do it today, like right now, because (laughs) this month, the members of Congress are really deciding their position uh, and they won't really, they'll be deciding their priorities and their position on the farm bill this month, believe it or not, even okay, though. So not it's March, 2023. When yes. We're right now. Okay. March, 2023 really need to focus, encourage you to write to your member of Congress and ask them to support the industrial agriculture accountability act. And you can find information on how to do that very easily at mercyforanimals.org 
forward slash IAA. So that's two A's, IAA for industrial animal, sorry, industrial agriculture accountability act. So that's just IAA. And you can see it's a very easy form where you can look at uh, just putting in your address, you can find your member of Congress and a form email comes up and you can adjust it and put in your own words, how you feel and how you'd like your member of Congress to support the IAA. Yeah. And I've filled that out myself because it also just makes it easier <laughs> to like when an organization has an action item like that um, to help, because a lot of times we don't bother to write our Congress people most of the time, even though we have strong opinions about things. And so, but I mean, certainly the agriculture industry is lobbying the heck out of them. And so we really need to, to do our own lobbying as well and share with our representatives. They're supposed to represent our interests. So it's important to, um, to let them know about it. Cause I know this is going to face a lot of opposition from, um, the, you know, some proponents within the, um, agricultural lobby who just want to do business as usual with corporate farming. And um, so I think it is a bit of an uphill battle. And so every, every, if a lot of us write in and, and talk about it, it shows that it's important. It's, it's critical. And I was in DC a couple of weeks ago and meeting with members of Congress and they would tell me, oh, we've heard a lot about the IAA. It oh, makes good. a difference. And they're this makes them pay attention. It moves up their priority list in, in terms of where their position could be. And I think you're right. This is There's a lot in this, in this marker bill yeah. and not all of it will pass. Change takes a long time. I always take heart from the, the other movements in history, the timeline yeah. for the women's rights movement, for example. It was 1849 when it was first introduced for women's suffrage movement. And it wasn't until... 1920 that it passed. So the proposal was introduced for 42 years or so every session before it was passed in 1919 and then sent to the states to be ratified in 1920. So we have to keep showing up. We have yeah. to keep highlighting. And this is the process. This is a process in our government. We have to keep introducing proposals like this. And piece by piece, it will get passed. I have every faith. Yeah. And this and just even having this this bill allows us to have a conversation that we're having today about all yes. these different things. And I have learned a lot, even though I thought I was well informed. And so this is um, this is a part a, a, an important aspect also to the bill, as you had mentioned before, is just raising awareness of what the issues are. So we can if you don't like the solution that's proposed in the current industrial accountability uh, Agriculture Accountability Act, maybe you can suggest something else, you know, to your congressperson, but at least yeah. it gets us talking because most of the time we just let business as usual, you know, go on and then it's just causing all kinds of havoc for, um, you know, our environment with the greenhouse gas emissions and the billions of animals and the vulnerable workers. And so, um, it, so it's, it's, you know, I'm so glad that we had this conversation. Me too. Um, well, that's the end of our show, but I want to thank you, Leah Garces, for being with us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. And thanks for the important work you and your staff and volunteers do at Mercy for Animals in creating a transformation, as you say, to a more just and ecologically sustainable food system that isn't reliant on exploitation of farmed animals or human workers. Well, thank you, Carrie, for creating the platform where we can talk about these important issues. Yeah, glad to do it. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to In Tune to Nature, broadcasting every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, online at wrfg.org and on Atlanta radio station 89.3 FM. We post action items, news, and podcasts on the show's website, facebook.com forward slash In Tune to Nature. The views and opinions expressed on this show do not necessarily reflect those of WRFG, its board, staff, or volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. I'm host Carrie Freeman asking you to please support independent, non-commercial media like Radio Free Georgia. And remember to take care of yourself and others, including other species. Thank you for listening. Cheers.